This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, having me back to the podium. Uh, looking out in the audience, there's quite a few very experienced, both carotid surgeons and carotid interventionists. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes is, is uh, show us where carotid stenting has been over the last decade and how it may advance here in the future. Uh, my disclosures, I am a, um, a site investigator for an upcoming uh, carotid stent trial, which I'll be discussing. And when, when discussing carotid stenting, it reminded me of this figure that I saw in the uh, British Medical Journal about Scott's parabola. And it really is not, it has nothing to do with carotid stenting, about, but about the rise and fall of a surgical technique. So, so a technique starts off as a promising idea, it initially uses a research tool. There's some encouraging reports and strong pressure for its uh, adoption. And then afterwards, after uh, it uh, becomes really almost standard treatment with, with, without a lot of data, and then soon uh, damaging reports come in, medical legal cases, and it soon falls into disuse. And in these typical uh, British terms, the operating theater staff ponders possible uses for large quantities of expensive obsolete equipments, and the very old surgeons uh, amaze their juniors with the rollicking stories of the old days. So will carotid stenting uh, fall down this uh, parabola? Um, carotid endarterectomy is really the basis on which we have to uh, compare all technologies. It's a safe, durable procedure with a small incision, a one-day stay, and a very low stroke rate. So really, um, it, everything else has to measure up to the bar of carotid endarterectomy. Carotid stenting uh, started off as a alternative back in the 1990s to carotid endarterectomy, mostly in high-risk patients, um, a minimally invasive procedure, and can be performed by specialties other than, than vascular surgeons. Um, and the floodgates really opened back, it's a little more than a decade now ago, 2004, with this New England Journal of Medicine uh, article presenting the SAFIRE trial evidence, which was the first randomized trial uh, comparing endarterectomy to stenting in both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. Um, and it was designed as a non-inferiority trial. A little hard to see the uh, data here, but you can see that when looking at life table analysis with the primary endpoint of uh, stroke death and MI, that stenting and endarterectomy were basically non-inferior uh, or equivalent to one another. Uh, and the primary endpoint actually carotid uh, stenting outperformed endarterectomy by 12% to 20%, albeit this is a pretty high rate for um, carotid endarterectomy. Well, really, this is where it became into, into full adoption. And uh, we were all really waiting for the results of a really well-designed NIH-sponsored multi-center trial. And the CREST trial was published in, in 2010, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, with, um, with uh, normal risk patients for carotid endarterectomy, but with very experienced both uh, interventionalists and with, um, and with uh, surgeons with using embolic protection devices in over uh, 2,500 patients enrolled. When we look at the results, I think we all know the results here, that um, the uh, combined endpoint of death stroke and MI, MI were equivalent statistically, 5.2% for carotid stenting and 4.5% for endarterectomy. But when you break down uh, into the subgroup analysis, uh, all stroke basically was, uh, was improved with uh, endarterectomy, 23 to 4.1%, and the difference in the conglomerate endpoint was really driven by a higher MI rate uh, with um, carotid endarterectomy, presumably because of general anesthesia. So, and these, uh, this data as far as stroke has now been presented out to four years, so more durable uh, stroke-free survival in, um, in uh, carotid endarterectomy versus stenting. Uh, the other problem with this is that in the patients that we really want to perform carotid stenting in, the, uh, the older patients over 75 years of age, in the CREST trial, really, there is a, a two-fold increase in stroke rate with um, patients over 75, so really is not performing where we wanted stenting to really uh, uh, improve our outcomes. So how do we improve outcomes? And this is really what's going to happen over the, the, uh, the next decade to improve. So we've all become uh, much better at the technique and the patient selection in carotid, uh, uh, in, uh, carotid stenting, that uh, now we have pretty standardized pre- and post-operative care, interoperative use of dual antiplatelets and, and embolic protection. And we know which patients to avoid, too, the patients with uh, circumferential calcification, octogenarians, shaggy arches, and type 3 arches. And, can't, uh, and so really, with just uh, doing this over the past um, decade, we've seen an improvement in outcomes, just, just from technique and patient selection improved from about 7 to 8 percent stroke rate down to about 3 percent, which is approaching carotid endarterectomy rates in carefully selected patients, there, that is. Um, and when you're looking at the variation of what can improve uh, neurogenic or neurologic outcomes, certainly operator experience in anatomy uh, really has the high, is the highest driver here. 
but technology also has quite a bit of variation that can be, um, can be improved upon and may even be more powerful than the choice between endarterectomy and stenting. So what I really want to focus on the last uh, 10 minutes or so here is uh, on stent design and on embolic protection strategy. So first I'll be discussing um, the, uh, the newer uh, stent trials using closed cell stent design. So carotid, carotid stent uh, design, uh, obviously the stent should be uh, deliverable, low profile, conformable to tortuosity, resistant to long-term fatigue, uh, resistance of fish scaling or the, uh, or the uh, metal struts of the stent overlapping each other, and the ability of the stents uh, to trap the lesion. So clearly there's a difference between the traditional open cell stent design with fewer communications between the, the interstices or a very uh, smaller lattice work using a closed cell stent design. Well, we know from performing um, carotid endarterectomy that plaques are heterogeneous and they can extrude a lot of material which can uh, form embolic debris later. And this, in this post-mortem uh, panel here to the right, showing a carotid stent um, with, um, with uh, embolic debris that's extruded out between the stent interstices. We can also see this in, uh, interprocedurally with, um, with high-resolution uh, IVIS, where you can see uh, with these arrows that the uh, material here exuding through the, the stent struts. Um, well, we know there's a, a difference between, uh, between different stents with their, with their um, stent uh, free cell area and closed cell stents such as wall stent, exact, and neck stent with a much lower free cell surface area rather than open cell uh, stents such as the Aculink. And this really changes not only the geometry of the stent but also its ability to, to trap plaque. Well, does this make a difference clinically? Well, this is uh, one study we might remember, the SPACE trial, which was uh, performed um, uh, before uh, or was released before um, the uh, CREST trial, which was a failed trial in Europe that was closed early, but when you look at a, a post hoc analysis of, um, of patients that received either a closed cell stent uh, versus an open cell stent, there's about a twofold reduction in uh, neurogenic uh, outcome rates um, based on just the stent uh, uh, design alone. Also from other trials, we see that a lot of the strokes that occur after carotid stenting are delayed. They occur after the embolic protection is, is removed. And in this uh, study by Bozers in 2007, two-thirds of strokes occurred after the removal of the embolic protection device up to 30 days afterwards. And you can see that there was a difference here, a protective effect with using a closed cell stent design versus open cell stent design. And even in our, carotid, uh, our CRUST trial, well-designed trial, we see that about 40% of the events that we saw in the stenting group, 19 out of the 29 events, occurred more than 24 hours afterwards. And presumably this is either due to late em uh, emboli from um, the plaque itself or from thrombus. So this has been taken advantage of by a m number of different uh, corporations uh, in designing closed cell stent designs. And these are some of them that are undergoing trials uh, with the Metronic uh, Cristallo Idel stent, the, uh, the Seaguard by Inspire MD, um, the Road Saver, which is a Trumo microvention trial I'll be talking about, and Gore has a proprietary closed cell uh, stent design which is, uh, which is covered with um, their proprietary PTFE. So when we look at the differences here in, um, in the free cell area, when you're looking at these newer closed cell stents, they're much smaller than the traditional closed cell stent. You can see here with uh, ranges of 165 microns to 500 microns as uh, compared to traditional closed cell stents of about 1,000 microns or open cell design with over 2,000 microns. So clearly they're uh, changing the, um, the uh, technology behind these stents. Well, where are we with the, uh, the data behind this? Is this, is this working? Well, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, only one uh, trial, the uh, Seaguard trial, that went through um, a Clarinet study in Europe that's gained CE mark. And the Road Saver trial, while it has some clear road data that I'll show you, um, there's no uh, current data for the new Gore uh, carotid stent uh, trial. Um, the clear road stent, again, this is, the, uh, this is a Trumo stent. It, its design is that it has a smaller latticework of, uh, of a stent inside a larger, more uh, conformable stent, so really a two-layer stent. And this was, this was uh, investigated with a 100-patient trial, single-arm trial in Europe, looking at stroke death and MI at 30 days and stroke within one year. Unfortunately, they had an um, a, uh, optional use of an embolic uh, protection device, less than 60%. But the outcomes with this, using this new stent design, were actually amazingly good. Only a 1% death and stroke rate and overall 2% MAE rate. And you can see here on uh, these uh, angiograms the ability of the stent to, con one, conform to tortuous anatomy, and two, have increased uh, coverage in, in the embolic area of the uh, lesion and very good opposition to the wall with, um, with intravascular ultrasound. 
Uh, the other stent, this is a sea guard stent. This has a PET uh, lattice work. This is the smallest uh, interstice size of, of the uh, current uh, closed cell stents. This had um, a smaller trial, albeit only a 30 patient trial in Europe, looking at endpoints at 30 days in one year. But interestingly, they also looked at uh, embolism using diffusion weighted MRI, and I'll show you some of that data. Uh, but their clinical outcomes, of, albeit only in 30 patients, were excellent. There's no stroke, death, and MI out to 30 days in these patients. And this is what I really found interesting when you're looking at new diffusion-weighted images on MRI, which they carefully looked at, with using this closed-cell stent design. One, they, when compared to other carotid stent trials, these are traditional carotid stent trials, there's about a 50% reduction in the number of, uh, of diffusion-weighted MRI lesions that are seen post-procedurally as well as about a 90% reduction in the volume of the diffusion-weighted MRI lesions, so meaning that there's fewer emboli, and if the emboli do get through, they're, either, uh, they're much smaller. Uh, shifting gears now, looking at new embolic protection strategies, I'll talk about um, new uh, proximal uh, protection strategies and flow reversal. And there's been three devices that have really been looking at uh, proximal occlusion for embolic protection. Um, the Gore or Perotti uh, device uh, was a device that I really liked. I use as my primary um, device. However, um, because of its uh, expense, its difficulty manufacturing and support, it was removed uh, from the market. So really, there's only two things out there currently that I'll discuss. One, the MoMA uh, device, which is a uh, flow arrest device, not a flow reversal device, and then the Silk Road device. But the uh, benefit of both of these devices is that it allows you to, um, to have protection prior to crossing the lesion. So the, um, the MoMA device uh, really is a flow arresting device. It has two balloons, one proximal in the common carotid and one in the uh, external carotid. Um, this was investigated using the ARMOR trial, which was a 225 patient single arm trial in the US and Europe, looking at high risk surgical patients and looking at endpoints out to, um, out to uh, one year. And when you look at the 30-day uh, the data for death stroke and MI, looking at both the intention to treat analysis and roll in, we're seeing improved uh, results here with proximal protection with a less than 1% death rate and a less than 2% stroke rate. The other um, the device I want to talk about is uh, the Silk Road device. I know there's many people in the audience that, that are currently using this. Uh, is a uh, minimally invasive technique, but really a hybrid technique using um, proximal protection by having clamping the common carotid artery at the base of the neck through a small cut down, and then, uh, and then using a flow reversal system, uh, an extra anatomic flow reversal system. The benefits are it can be done just under local anesthesia, minimally invasive through a small cut down with reversed uh, cranial nerve injury compared to, um, to uh, end arterectomy, but really it avoids div uh, navigating uh, difficult arches, and this is really the uh, defining technical problem that we have with uh, performing carotid stents as, as difficult arches and, um, and uh, creating debris prior to the uh, placement of the stent. Um, really, we're talking about type two and type three arches at which there's very difficult uh, time cannulating the arch, uh, as well as uh, difficulty with calcified arches and proximal disease. So this is the, um, the Silk Road system, if you haven't seen it. There's a cut down at the base of the neck with a proximal uh, common carotid clamp. Um, it's a six French sheath, and then it has a reversal mechanism, which can be run at either high or low uh, flow rates, reversing blood, going through a filter, and then returning it through ephemeral uh, puncture. Uh, the nice thing is it can be used with any six French uh, carotid stent system you want, does not need distal protection, um, and avoids arch navigation with a pretty simple closure of a, of a six French puncture of the sheath. Um, their, uh, their trial, um, the uh, Silk Road trial, uh, the Roadster um, Pivotal trial really used very complex patients. About two-thirds of the patients were over the age of 75, a quarter were symptomatic, and about 50% had uh, physiologic high-risk factors. And in this high-risk trial, they had, uh, when you're looking at the uh, Pivotal group with the intention to treat analysis, there was really a very low uh, stroke rate, 0% major strokes, um, out to 12 months. 1% uh, minor stroke and a, and a less than 3% combined uh, MAE rate, or stroke and death rate, I should say. And looking at the patients we really want to treat, the high-risk patients, either age greater than 75 or symptomatic patients, um, there were uh, no major or minor strokes and uh, excellent results in both the, uh, the symptomatic group and in the elderly group where we really, we're really um, have uh, worse outcomes with carotid endarterectomy. And also looking at diffusion-weighted um, uh, MRIs, they looked at this with the, um, in the, uh, this uh, proof data, but when there's uh, about the equivalent rate of having new uh, DWI MRI images, about a less than 20% rate with, um, with carotid stenting 
using the uh, flow reversal system, as, and it's comparable to doing a, a clamp and back bleeding through carotid and darterectomy, and about uh, one fourth the uh, the rate as with um, traditional transfemoral carotid stenting. So, in conclusion, uh, what we've seen is that periprocedural stroke and death rates in patients undergoing carotid stenting have decreased over the last 10 years, the last decade. Um, this trend is partially due to improvements in technique and patient selection, which we all have done. Uh, and increased operator experience, but I believe that the next generation stents and embolic protection strategies may further in, uh, improve the uh, performance of, uh, of carotid stenting, and it may not fall in this downside of the curve of uh, Scott's parabola, and in, instead having improved, uh, improved uh, results compared to carotid and arterectomy. Thank you. One question. So uh, I was uh, uh, impressed with Dr. Westmore's secondary analysis of the Crest trial uh, with length of lesion. Uh, do you use length of lesion as a criteria to say yes or no to stenting? Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the other high risk uh, features of the plaque itself, certainly. The more uh, high risk plaque, longer plaques, more heterogeneous plaques, I think are all going to be higher risk as well as circumferential calcification. So I think that all comes down to uh, patient selection, Joe, and, and that's something that, uh, that uh, we've all learned which lesions to avoid. Dr. Lane, thank you for a nice presentation. I'm Wade Smith from UCSF, and I'll follow up a little bit but, uh, in my talk. But I was, um, it's really fun to see us turn full circle and go back to direct carotid access. Um, can you uh, tell about your experience with the carotid dissection or damaging the common carotid with direct puncture? And secondly, could you comment on how long it takes um, before getting access to the time that you can stent? Because there's consideration of doing this access for acute embolectomy and acute stroke. Because uh, it's a shorter distance, all the issues you describe about having to go through the arch and all um, are mitigated by direct access. I'm sort of curious about how quick this procedure and safe it is. Yes, yeah, so um, I am not one of the trialists in the Roadster trial, so I, I would defer that. There's people in the audience here, Dr. Uh, Dr. Schneider and uh, Dr. D. Robertis, that both have been uh, uh, trialists there. But, um, but the, uh, the, the length of the procedure is very short. It's about a 45-minute procedure, which um, is, is considerably shorter than most people can do an endarterectomy. Um, safely, and then um, as far as your question about avoiding carotid dissection, I think that can be a problem, especially with very deep and thick necks if you're having a very acute angle upon entry with the device. So I think that can be an issue and certainly takes, there's going to be a learning curve, uh, but those of us that are, that are comfortable with doing carotid end arterectomy uh, cut down on the neck I think is, uh, is, uh, is safe and can be done even in, in, a, in the deep neck, which I think is the real issue there. Um, as far as other neurointerventional techniques that can be done through the base of the carotid cut down, um, I uh, look forward to hearing what your thoughts are, and, and uh, maybe Dr. Schneider has some more uh, comments on it that he can share with us. So we've been doing TCAR for a little while, and it is, uh, there's definitely a learning curve, but it's pretty straightforward. Most of the procedures take about 45 minutes. We actually do them under local. Um, with the little cut down. We've not had a problem with uh, injury to the common carotid, but I think we're pretty careful in selection, and so yeah, there's got to be an adequate distance between the clavicle and the bifurcation and, and not have a neck that, or a carotid that's too deep so that you're apt to have difficulty or to get an injury. But, but the dissection issue is usually when you do the puncture, if you're just not careful uh, with your needle puncture, and if you uh, create a little dissection in the common, that could be an issue. Um, but, but we've actually found it, in, in at least my own bias is, and based on the data that John shared, is that I, I think this is by far and the way likely the most safe way to do carotid stenting. You, you, the trade-off is an incision, but usually that's a fairly minor deal, and, and once you get through the learning curve, it's pretty straightforward. So I guess my question would be, the study had 26 percent uh, symptomatic. Uh, and I'm curious, for those of us who practice at stroke centers, we had about a 26% asymptomatic and probably more than 50 and probably approaching 70% of our patients are referred directly from the stroke service acutely. So um, is carotid stenting going to be relevant for someone who has an acute stroke and a hemorrhagic lesion? Because our practice has completely flipped, uh, and we're probably doing it, approaching 70%. 
symptomatic, acutely symptomatic patients. I'd love to see an asymptomatic patient come in that we could think about this. Yeah, well, that's why I think some of this new technology is going to be going to be good for treating the uh, the symptomatic patient, uh, both with proximal protection and with these uh, these more vulnerable lesions that uh, that can be treated perhaps better with a closed cell stent design. So with the combination of doing that, yeah, I think we've all seen an increase in symptomatic patients in our practice. And I'm doing less uh, asymptomatic patients in my practice currently, but I think some of these new technologies that I that I presented have the have the promise to be able to treat those patients well. I have a question about the study you mentioned that uh, made uh, embolic protection optional. Is that uh, not considered the standard of care to use an embolic protection device that they made it optional, or do you do you understand the reasoning behind that for that study design? No, I, I actually I wish I could explain it. I mean, I, it, it certainly is standard of care here in the United States, uh, in Europe, where this uh, some of this data was from, where they used optional embolic protection. Um, I think they just. I think it was because they left it at the direction of the uh, of the interventionalist, and I think that's some of the weaknesses of trying to translate not just carotid data, but from any European data, and translating it to the United States, where we have really a different standard of care and different practice. And then, uh, one other question. This may not be totally relevant to what you talked about, but I can't think of any other part of the the program to ask this question, but the, the question of whether or not we should be intervening on asymptomatic patients, um, I, I really love to get an update every year at this talk. Um, you know, Crest 2, I thought was going to give us more information, but I, I have not heard any updates myself. Um, and then, you know, the question of always, you know, I, I can't remember the last time I heard ACAS referred to, but, you know, doing endarterectomies on asymptomatic patients with 60% stenosis. I think is almost unheard of, although there's people that still probably do that. Um, and, and then the other question is, stenting is still illegal in patients, CMS patients, who are not high risk for surgery and greater than 70% stenosis. So outside of an IDE, where are we stenting these other patients? Right. Well, some of it is uh, people that are involved in registries and trials. That's where we're really getting into stenting into asymptomatic patients. So I think that's where this data is coming from. And and, so and, is and the it, hope it that we're going to get CMS to change their mind, is that, is that basically the plan? Because <laughs> it doesn't serve any purpose outside of the IDE. Well, that's, that's not my purpose, certainly. And I think I'm a, still a pretty firm believer in carotid uh, endarterectomy. And I think that we've all changed our practice with better medical care to the first part of your question, that we're we, probably our thresholds are now increased and most people are not doing endarterectomy on asymptomatic patients until they reach 80% or greater. The 60% uh, from I, a, ACAS I don't think really is in current, currently in current clinical practice. But I think that's where the, there is data still being gained and I, about the use in uh, asymptomatic patients. Certainly, CREST2 is going to tell us a lot more about medical care. I think that's a very pertinent question and uh, we're going to be one of the CREST2 trial sites. Um, with uh, in the medical arm as well, and so I, I, I really is something that I think carotid practice is still in a state of evolution, not only because of new technology and, and procedures, but also in better medical care. I think is really where we're going to make the biggest inroads. So Crest Two is ongoing. Uh, we are one of the uh, top ten recruiting sites at the San Francisco VA, which is a 110 pet hospital. So what does that tell you? Um, it tells you recruiting in the outside is going very, very slowly. Wade, do you know where we are now? We're, we're at 500, I think? 500 Yeah, so um, it, it remains to be seen as to how close to 2,000 Crest II actually, actually gets. And there's an abstract uh, that I think will be presented at the, the vascular meetings and looking at the Crest II recruitment data showing that the, the in, uh, private practice, uh, the recruitment is going extremely slowly, um, whereas in the VA and other places where we have, you know, it, it's admittedly a unique relationship with the patient, but there's also not a monetary issue. Um, it's going along uh, pretty well. And I think the take-home message from that is if we don't recruit these patients and get them in the trial, I don't think we're going to be happy with the analysis of a trial that is not powered to actually come up with the data to show that one that intervention is better than medical therapy. 